How do you extract value from the profile and reputation you've built in the marketplace? How can you package and leverage your knowledge and expertise for greater influence and impact? Welcome to Reputation Revolution, the show where we dissect what's involved in commercializing and profiting from your professional personal brand. You've put in the hard yards. Now it's time to capitalize. Let's dive in. G'day, welcome to the Reputation Revolution Show. My name is Trevor Young. Now, as we know, building a sustainable business off the back of one's personal brand is the holy grail for many of us. Doing doing our own thing, being true to ourselves and our values, living by our wits and making a good living doing so. But it ain't easy. What is easy is to get stuck in the same rut professionally and personally, uh, to become scared to stand out, to change things up, to muck around with a formula that it's perhaps worked for you in your business over time. But maybe you'll feel you're becoming less and less relevant in a world that's moving, let's face it, at warp speed. Today's topic is large and unwieldy and messy and oh so relevant for uh, all of us. Really, really an important topic or top series of topics that I'm going to be discussing. And, we, and I've put it under the banner of purpose, passion, principles and profit. We're going to cover the lot with a good dollop of health and wellness tips, insights and wisdom from someone who's been in the trenches for absolutely decades and is still out there at age 78 fighting the good fight. I speak of none other than Dr. John Tickell. Let's hear from him now. Welcome to the show, John. Uh, what were you doing? I usually ask my guests what they were doing 10 years ago. I'm going to mix it up. What were you doing 40 years ago? Now, Trevor, if I had the second leading, leading cause of death in Australia called Alzheimer's, I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing 40 years ago. Uh, I'm over my brain cancer. I can remember your name. It's Trevor Young. And 40 years ago, I had just opened one of the best, biggest resorts in Australia called the Hyatt Regency at Coolum up near Moosa, which was the first, let's call it, health resort in Australia. Wow, that, and that's not, not something that uh, a medical doctor usually does. Uh, why don't you unravel a few of the things you've done uh, because I've done some homework, but I've the list is too long, but I'm gonna, I've got a couple of things here um, that I've, I've got here. So you've researched uh, healthy longevity in 100 countries. You've survived brain cancer for 14 years. You've owned a Melbourne Cup winner which in uh, for international uh, international um, listeners, uh, the Melbourne Cup is the preeminent horse race in, in Australia and worth uh, a lot of money. And you have 11 grandchildren. So uh, there's a fair bit, but that's only touching the surface. You've been a professional athlete. Um, you've practised medicine for how many years now? Well, I graduated. Uh, we've got a reunion. It's... Uh... It's the 55-year reunion of our medical group uh, next Sunday. So uh, and it's interesting, the word practice. I mean, would you, uh, Trevor, would you want to go to a lawyer that's still practising? You'd want them to be perfect, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, you'd want them to be knowing what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, so I have been in the medical field for 55 years and I was a part-time obstetrician. Uh, I had to change my name because I was called Dr. Tickle. So being an obstetrician didn't work, so I'm now Dr. Tickell. And I was also a part-time general practitioner. And after a few years, I, I thought that GPs had become, well, we were becoming a bit of a social worker where people would come in and we were initially booked four patients an hour. I was in a semi-rural area called Whittlesea, which is north of Melbourne, yep. by 20, 30 miles. And, uh, and then we got so busy that we started to book six patients an hour, which meant 10 minutes a patient. And the expectation, I think this, this is still, when you go to the doctor, do you expect to leave with a prescription? Uh, no. <laughs> Well, most patients in those days, and I think still do, so I think the practice of general practice has become a lot like a pat on the head and, then, you know, I think you're okay, but why don't you take these and I'll yeah. see you in two So I started to wonder why so many people were getting sick and the last three years has emphasised that with a thing, a little virus called COVID something, 19, and... Uh, 
and then all the mental health issues came to the fore and you read, you know, beyond blue and beyond that and whatever, whatever. And some people say, oh, 15% of us and 20% of us and 90 Hey, listen, I'll tell you something. 100% of us have had mental health issues in the last three to four years because we're in a different environment. A lot of people couldn't go to work because the Premier in Australia, in the, well, Victoria, we are the worst closed down, lockdown in the world. Mm. And if we went more than five k's from our house, we got fined, I don't know, 1,500 or five grand or something. And, you know, we couldn't work. So, and the schooling, the homeschooling, I mean, that puts so much pressure on parents. Call it stress, call it what you like. And and so the, the whole world is now emerging from that, but it's different, Trevor. So I started... Then I flew to California to see some 85-year-old guy do presentations about a thing called prevention. Have you ever heard of preventing things? <laughs> I hope so, yes. <laughs> well, when you get on a Qantas jet, you might have seen uh, Rain Man uh, when he was in Vegas trying to get to uh, LA and he was talking to, who was a superstar? Uh, what was it? Um, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Yeah. Saying, there's no Qantas flights from Vegas to LA. And Tom Cruise said, it doesn't matter. We get on any plane. He said, no, no, no. Qantas have never had a crash. See, Qantas have never, ever, ever lost a passenger from a jet flight. So it's theoretically and practically the safest airline in the world. Because Qantas have, they don't have annual checks on their planes. It's every four months. And every pilot on a Qantas jet has to go through a checkpoint list of 42 things before he's allowed to go out onto the runway. And so never have, having lost a, a passenger on a Qantas jet makes them safe because of prevention. Now, if you, well, let me ask you, did you get COVID or not? Uh, yeah, got a, had it a couple of times. Okay, so in theory, your immune system, Trevor, wasn't as good as mine because uh, your immunity allowed the virus to get into your body. And you've got a lot, a lot of bodies and it mutates and it starts to take over the body. So when people say, yeah, but how, how do you fix your immune system? Well, that's one of my, let's call it clever, uh, series of events where me and my medical doctor, kids and family have been to 103 countries on this planet. Do you know how many countries there are in the world? 140 something? No, no, it's 200. Oh. It, it, David, it depends on who's fighting who. Yeah, geography is not a strong suit. <laughs> We're over half the countries in the world looking at the living habits of the longest living, healthiest people. Now, our life expectancy, the Australian government invented a thing called the pension in 1935. The pension was available to people who didn't have a lot of money at age 65. Life expectancy was 63. So it didn't cost them much money. Our life expectancy now is 82 and a half males, 84 and a half females. So it's interesting that our life expectancy, people say, oh, yeah, but it's going to be 100 soon, our life expectancy. Well, the answer is no, it's not, because what's happening, the, the last Australian Institute of Health and Welfare stats just told us, Australia, that 87%, 9 out of 10 of us at age 65 have already got one chronic disease. We're living a bit longer, but we're getting sicker earlier. So I am in the business of preventing from you from getting. Do you remember life being it? I do. Life... Uh, for, um, it was a health public health campaign, and again we, yeah. we go out to uh, the US and the UK, uh, particularly with this podcast. So yeah. everything you're saying is relevant to them too. I mean, it's um, in terms of. You know, having pensions and 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 uh, how long people are living for and chronic disease, uh, you'd probably say for those major com countries. Obviously, there are some countries that you've gone to where the um, you know the the expected um, you know length for people to live is is much longer. Well, we're, we're in the top ten. I mean, I I know a little bit about the US. America's life expectancy is not as good as Australia's. But what's happening is our health expectancy is getting worse because li we're literally getting sicker, sicker earlier. I mean, we're, ne we're now the WHO, World Health Organization. We are number one cancer sufferers in the world. More cancer cases per head than any population on earth. You've always, you've always got causes to fight. How long have you been fighting these health causes for? 
Um, and obviously they evolve as, as you know, the d- different health issues. But um, how long have you been um, in this fight for? Uh, half a medical life. 20, oh, well, I'm coming up. I started all this when I was 35 and I'm now nearly 80. So that's what, 45 years I've been in the fight. So I'm fighting for human beings to be self-responsible. I, Trevor, I've, I invented an, a new pill. I'll send you one if you like. Uh, the, the pill is a purpose in life. Now, one of the stupid things ever invented in the Western world is called retire. I mean, if you're tired, why would you want to get retired? I mean, the people in the islands of Okinawa are the longest living, healthiest people on earth. There's, there's no word for retirement. There's no word for menopause. Uh, so having these causes to fight and purpose, so that's what I sort of, you know, yes. clicking that, you know, from the he- headline of this episode, Purpose, Passion, Principles and Profit, um, yes. you're sort of ticking off all of those three with this thing. I mean, your purpose in life is to, you know, to educate and to fight the good fight, to keep us healthy mentally and physically. Um, and, and obviously there's there's a lot of bodies and involved in that, as in government bodies, et cetera. Um, you, but... You know that's part of as a as a, a medical practitioner, mm-hmm. but you're also a, a professional speaker. I mean, most of your business now is that medical or speaking? Ah, uh, well, you can mix it up. I'm I've got to the stage where I'm on a stage. I'm no Elvis Presley or uh, Olivia Newton John, but I can. It's interesting, Trevor. When you're a professional speaker, people will only pay you. I call it THV only if you've got take-home value. So when people leave an audience and they've done research follow-up projects, 18 out of 20 people remember some of the points I've made, I call them anchors, and they institute some changes. Like, for example, I invent, 28 years ago I invented AFDs, alcohol-free days. So when's the last time you, had a, you gave your liver a rest and had an alcohol-free day? Me personally, uh, last couple of nights. Well done. Not tonight, but last couple of nights. <laughs> yeah, well done. See, a, a, a lot of people who are destroying their own liver and brain, they drink every day because it's become a habit. And when you change your habit, it, like, do you clean your teeth every night? Every hour? No, every night. Oh, every night, yeah. A few times, okay. three times a day. Why do you do that? Habit. <laughs> yeah, somebody must have told you. Yeah, taught, taught very well. <laughs> taught. Like, like your, your mum or your dad said, clean your teeth before Thanks. you go to bed, clean your teeth. And once you've done that for 91 days, that's become a normal habit. Yep. So when people say, oh, Doc, I haven't got time to exercise, I say, right, let's look at it this way. Trevor, you sleep how many hours an hour a night? Uh, average, what, seven, eight? Yep. So if you sleep for seven hours, you're awake for 17 hours in a day, and in 17 hours is 34 half hours. So every week you're awake for 238 half hours. Now, if you're one of the 90% of people who don't do enough exercise, you'll say, yes, so what? I said, well, get out your diary on a Sunday night. Now, you've got 238 half hours in the next week, and you're saying you can't find six of those to take yourself for a brisk walk. I mean, you've got VIPs. You've got a point, you know, you and I had an appointment at 3 o'clock today. It's, it's in red in my diary. But I've also got at 5.30, I'm going for a swim. So I'm making appointments with myself like everyone in the world should be. And and don't forget, as a parent, you got any kids, Trev? Yeah. Okay. The best thing, the most important thing in your and your partner's life is being role models. So when people say, oh, my kid won't eat vegetables, I say, right, oh, well, if you have six or seven different vegetables on your plate every night, you don't force them to eat them. But if they see you doing something, they start, oh, yeah, I'll have to try a bit of this, try a bit of that. So, so it's interesting life being a role model. And, and when you get into business life, then there's this whole new thing now about how to be a good leader. And I was lucky enough to talk with Richard Branson in a conference uh, we were presenting it uh, together and I went into his room and, and, and I said, Richard, can you give me a tip? He said, a tip about what? And I said, about life, about business, about leadership. So he said, 
a leader should look after his people like he would like to be or he or she would like to be looked after. In terms of leadership, and people say, yeah, but I'm not a manager. I say, yeah, you are managing yourself. So it's not how wealthy you are or how smart you are or whether you're a leader or not. It's you looking in the mirror saying, hey, I've been given a gift. It's called the human body. And you can't have health without mental health, and they both stick together. So unless you're prepared to spend a few minutes every day, I mean, you know, every hour, Trevor, I would suggest you take three deep breaths. And you say, why? And I say, because it's a form of meditation. Oh, I didn't know that. So when I get on the stage and do the follow-up stuff, I send people notes. One of the, one of the little tricks of being a good speaker is to send the MD or the, the HR person a bunch of notes, just simple and two pages with dot points that they distribute to the delegates. So, and then I send out a monthly newsletter called Health Sense. I mean, all the viewers, all the listeners can, you know, subscribe to my Health Sense. I say, how much it is? I'll send a cup of coffee a month. Well, what? It's says four bucks. And it's interesting how many people in the world want that constant reminder about the health sense. And if it's a company, it's tax deductible because you're looking after your employees. And uh, it, it's interesting that, you know, if, when you do your interviews, Trevor, you do some preparation. You, you probably write a few. You've, you've done so your homework on me. So whatever you're going to achieve in life, the great Colin Hayes, the racehorse trainer, he said, the future belongs to those who plan for it. So I'm not one of these guys who gets up at 4am and writes down my daily goals, my weekly goals, my yearly goals, but I've got end goals. So being outspoken on these topics, and clearly you've been doing it, you know, as you said, for, for you know, over 40 years, when did you start writing books? You've had four books uh, or five now? You've got a new one. I'm doing, I'm doing my 14th book. I'm writing a book with Olivia's husband. Okay. It's called, it's called Do You Want Cancer? Yes or No? Because don't forget that one in three, you, your partner or one of your best friends is going to get cancer and half of us don't need to. It. So Do You Want Cancer? Now, my first book I wrote, wrote after I had a meeting with George Burns. Remember the comedian, the American Absolutely. comedian? He, he yeah. lived a good long life. <laughs> He lived till he was 100 and he was 98 when I met him. And I don't know how I get, got him to see him. I convinced his manager that uh, I could, you know, we could chat about humour because George Burns laughed himself through life. And uh, I, I said to George, I'm, I'm so pleased to meet you. And he said, uh, yeah, so why are you here, Doc? And I said, well, you're 98. I reckon I can keep you alive till you're 100. He said, no worries, I got that covered. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I've got a motto, moderation in everything except laughter, sex, vegetables and fish. And so I said, which is the more important? He said, I don't, I don't care. But if you do them all together, it makes a hell of a mess. So, <laughs> so I said to him, can I use that? He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to call the book Laughter, Sex, Vegetables and Fish. He said, I don't care. He said, I'll be dead in a couple of years. And, and the other <laughs> The other thing that I heard, uh, the New York Times, I get that now and again, airports and stuff, and when George turned 100, the media approached him on his 100th birthday and then George, 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 congratulations, you're 100. But what's your doctor say about you still puffing away on a cigar now and again? He said, my doctor's dead. <laughs> so... The other thing, if you can, if you're able to put some funny lines together as part of a presentation, yeah, people will listen. Because yeah. what I watch when I'm presenting on stage is how many people look at their watch. You know, if they're looking at their watch, you've gone too long. So you're you're on stage um, these days. How many speaking gigs would you be doing? You know, on average now. Uh, well, during COVID, very few, as mm. you and I had so much trouble getting to look at each other on the Zoom or whatever it's called, or Rev the Side or Zoom or something. Um, and it's difficult. I mean, I got good at Zoom conferences because I still, I mean, uh, one of my favourites now is talking to school kids because I've invented a bunch of characters called the the, the, the Indestructibles and they, they, they play off against the nasties, like the nasties like nicotine and Doug Drug. And, so 90% of chronic smokers start when they're teenagers. 
So this is nicotine. This guy roves in he, in packs of 20s and he's trying to get inside your body and fill up all your arteries with, with SH1T and gets into your lungs and puts tar and all that sort of stuff and, and, and you know, then cancer the crab comes in and, get, and grabs you and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it, it, if you... It's impossible to be intelligent and smoke at the same time. So again, having to having to do different audiences because a lot of it's corporate as well. You're still doing the corporate stuff, or you, you yeah, know, yeah. this is yeah. part of the, um, you know, the new purpose is to just you know get get them younger. Uh, well, it's it's more difficult. You see, there's a thing called a dangerous decade, Trevor. I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but the dangerous decade used to be 45 to 55. When people started to fall to bits and they're thinking about retirement and they're thinking about getting a new portion, a new wife and all those sort of things. So um, about corporate audiences, it, it's it's about them, you know, the old, there's no IN team and all that sort of stuff. But, but when, when in a corporate environment, you're not there to impress people. You're there to do, it's a bit like footy coach. You don't have to kick 18 goals every match. You do your part in the team. So, yeah, it's a matter of engaging an audience, throwing them anchors like if – have you ever heard of the cat syndrome? No. You can tell how well you're coping by how much cats you – caffeine, alcohol, tobacco and sugar. So caffeine, if you're drinking more than two or three cups a day, you're a dill, your blood sugar swinging like this and you have mood change and all that. Alcohol, we know that alcohol damages your liver and your brain. And men, you know, that drink more than two alcoholic drinks a day. And don't forget, drinks are different. Like seven ounces of beer is the same as four ounces of wine and one ounce of spirit. So if you drink a bottle of scotch, that's not one drink, it's 26. So, you know, cats, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco. If you smoke zero cigarettes a day or, or vape, vape, zero e-cigs or vapes, then that's the right amount because not one. And don't forget vaping and smoking, secondhand smoke. The World Health Organization, 10% of illnesses and deaths from smoking are from the smoke you blow out. In terms of fixing people, it's all very well to cure something, but preventing it is so much better. So what drives you? What drives you after for so long doing all this? Um, you know, th this keeps you, uh, you're in front of the trends, what's going on. Um, you're, you're, you know, you remain very curious just by talking to you, um, yeah. uh, you know, and that, that feels to me that that's a reason, you know, your purpose, uh, your values, what you believe in, plus your kind of curiosity, um, that, Builds longevity in your uh, in your professional life, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mentioned the word retire. I'm never going to retire because I don't want to get tired. I'm I am I'm hell bent on doing good for people, leaving the world in a better place. And, and we know now with ten grandchildren, and then, you know, my wife had a surprise baby at the age of forty four. So we've got a kid who's turning thirty, and he's some IT te technician genius. Um, and he's going to get married. So it, it's it's watching kids grow up today. The, the, the other problem, no, it's not problem. It's it's actual the actual thing about little kids today. They're not as active. I mean, you know, when when I was, I don't know what happened to your in your family, Trevor, but I had to be home by dark and you'd be out in the gutter playing mud pies, getting an immune system and kicking the footy and cricket and all that sort of stuff, and running around the home by dark. But, but now they're playing computer games when they get home from school. So, you know, I, I think technology has been good in some departments, but, you know, our kids are living in front of screens 24-7 and, you know, they're having sleeping problems and all that sort of stuff. So my purpose in life now is, you know, I've got – I'm starting a club called Health to 100. In fact, my new TV show in America – sorry, sorry, here in Australia next year. I've got a lot of sponsors and everything – because they want to be seen out there as health to 100. People say, oh, I've only lived on 100. That's because your perception of a 100-year-old is sitting, somebody sitting in a wheelchair in a rest home with tubes stuffed in every hole in their body. And so, but 100-year-olds, as I've proven, looking around the world and the Okinawans and all this sort of stuff, they're just like, they're like we are when we're 60 because they, they've eaten basic food, they work in the fields, they don't retire, they're, 
I'll use this word, they're spiritual. They live in villages. They, they don't live in the 64-storey block of concrete with a microwave and no backyard. I mean, that's the, one of the other problems with the kids today. We, there's no backyard. <laughs> it's, no, you know, no garden, no footing, footing and cricket in the backyard. They're like, how can you exist in a block of concrete when, you, when you're eight years old? Yeah. So it's, it's a matter of, one, going back to basics, two, looking at the longest living, healthiest people on earth and doing copycat stuff. You know, what do they eat? What do they do? They work in the fields. They move every day. They don't go to a gym. I mean, you know, I know a guy, a guy who, who used to drive to the gym, took him half an hour, ride, ride the push bike or the treadmill for half an hour and drive over and said, well, why don't you ride your bike to the gym and back and not, and not go in? You'll save two grand. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's these sort of things where, and don't forget, human beings are not carnivores. We're made as omnivores. So, yes, we can eat a little bit of meat, but if you live on meat and non-plant things, it fills up your gut. So the, we're the second best in the world at getting bowel cancer because, you know, all this stuff, toxins, is living in our gut because you know, one of the worst things in rest homes is people get constipated. And I say to them, well, eat 20 prunes every day. They say, what? That, that fixes you without any medication. Yeah, so, so all these natural things that can help us. So if if anyone out there wants to, you know, join Health Sense once a month and give up four bucks and half of that goes to your Living Nutrients Foundation, then you know there'll be the prompters, the little the, the little value anchors every month to say, hey, why don't you try this? Not do it. It's these are, these are the options. So what I can grasp here from you know in terms of having a uh, sustaining a let's call it a personal brand based enterprise, um, yeah. you know, multiple different um, income streams for you. Uh, speaking being one of the the core ones that, that that's been over the journey, but obviously a lot of media. Um, so you you're, you've remained curious. You're you're always doing research. Uh, you're building on your body of work. Uh, you're not afraid to experiment. Um, I think that that's that's a key thing of putting stuff out there and, you know, um, maybe failing on stuff, but you're willing to have a crack uh, and, and you're very authentic in, in what you do. Your message, um, you know, it doesn't matter where I've heard you, your message has been the same. I was just going to throw in a curly one there when you said experiment. I was the first patient to take a risk when I was diagnosed with brain cancer. I had a seizure on an aeroplane and, you know, whipped in and I'm in an emergency, blah, blah, anyway, uh, after they drilled a hole in my head and told me what sort of cancer it was, there was an oncologist there, an Asian guy from New York, and he said, Doc, he said, there's just been a brand-new immunotherapy drug. We've tested it on mice and rats and a few humans, and it looks really good. He said, if you go on a try, he said, it's 70,000 a dose. You'll be on it for six months. And he said, if you sign this bit of paper, I can get you on the trial, and it's nothing. So I signed here. And, you know, it was one of the things, plus the Okinawan principles of eating that saved my life. So to take a risk and have a brand-new drug that hadn't been tested a lot, it's a bit like the vaccine. You know, people say, oh, I'm not going to have the vaccine. It hasn't been tested long enough. Hey, UNICEF vaccines have saved 3 million lives a year since 1946. I mean, why haven't we got whooping cough? Why haven't we got tuberculosis? Why haven't we got polio? Why haven't we got all those sort of things, smallpox? Because of vaccines that improve your immune system. Better leave on that note. Uh, Doc, it's been fantastic. Um, Lots of stories. We could have probably chatted for another couple of hours. Um, and where's the best place to send people then online? Is it uh, drjohntickell.com.au? Is that the right one? Uh, I think it's all one word, drjohntickell, drjohntickell.com. Uh, yeah, and, um, you know, you can chat about Health Sense or whatever you want to do to help yourself and help um, your company and help the world be a better place. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Trevor, thank you. You're a genius. Thank you for listening to this episode of Reputation Revolution, the personal brand monetization show. Today's digital first world is ever changing, but one thing remains constant. Reputation equals revenue and opportunities are everywhere. To learn more, subscribe to our newsletter today at reputationrevolution.co.